thousand realms in a single thought moment. <laughs> if you think about this teaching being almost 3,000 years old, the concept of the mind parsing out, or not really parsing out, just glomming and gleaning a few energetic potentials, manifestations uh, in within tendencies and conditions of the moment being the predominant choices, decisions, basis for moving to the next moment moment to moment to moment, uh, even as I try to describe that, it's pretty darn sophisticated uh, minutia of the way life moves through time space. How would you begin to describe that or explain that to people who uh, have a very strong tendency toward reliance, I will say, on magical thinking. Assigning complexity to forces or entities outside of themselves because they can't possibly fathom for themselves this activity. I mean, just look around today at the people that we encounter or, uh, or uh, hear about or see on our uh, multifarious uh, um, transports of videos and programs and so on and so forth. Um, you know, we grow up thinking our exploration as babies, this observational, trying to figure out this reality. And we do things and we, we the first thing we start experimenting with, maybe not the first, but one of the first, is cause and effect relationships, yeah? Like every time I push this off of the table, mommy comes running and she reacts in a funny way. So I'll push it off again. Wow, look at that relationship. Isn't that amazing? Cause effect. And then when we try that cause and we look around and mama isn't coming, Ah, oh, it didn't work. Like total destruction. Thanks for being here today. Appreciate your practice. Appreciate your being here. Please like and subscribe at some point. Um, your support is everything for this channel to exist. That's why it exists. But in it, it's I I read something or heard something recently in that in that gap between I do something and there's an effect I do something and the effect doesn't occur there's a perceived gap there like oh 
something isn't doing what I expect. Therefore, and this is where we externalize, something else is at work. Something is getting in the way. Something is influencing my life because I've made this cause and I didn't get the effect I was expecting. And right away, it's like built into the human mind, right? It's got to be out there somewhere. Something, someone, right? This idea of surveillance it's uh, it's conjured quite quickly in the human psyche. And so there's been a litany of con men, con women, who will slide right into that gap and tell you like somehow they are the proxy for that force. And religion happens. <laughs> <laughs> so still today very powerful lobby these manipulators and con artists aren't they uh, and how many of them are conned themselves into thinking that what they're doing is somehow I mean they con the cons right but without making this a video about that um, more importantly is in the face of that because it's immense that tendency yeah how does someone who perceives the 3000 realms in a single thought moment begin to discuss that problem that problematic that that source of all delusions, that, that tendency. Without adding to the fire, without sounding magical themselves. There's obviously that tendency exists because of a, a, a deep, I don't know what word to use, a, a functional uh, tension of human sentient mind to want that resolution so immediately that it breaks reason, it breaks rationality, it just wants to seize upon any, oh, teddy bear did it? Okay, teddy bear did it. I'm cool, I'm complete, I'm resolved. What? We just want that thing filled up. We want to know between if cause and effect, what's that thing? And, and Buddhism teaches continuously, there is nothing between cause and effect. They're actually the same thing. Their manifestation, it's fluid. Many, many things come together in every cause in order to express an effect. But that expression is built into the cause. So it's already there. Just because you don't experience it in the immediate moment, whether you're conscious enough to know that you can experience every moment is one question or not, doesn't preclude the mechanism. It's the wandering about and the lack of insight and understanding that confounds us. And this is the crux of Buddhism. We keep coming at this same problem from various angles. Why do I say all this? Well, we're about, Nichiren is about, to dive into the 3000 realms again. But this time he's going to go into it from a standpoint of the depths and the order of Shakyamuni's teachings. And he's going to demonstrate 
through quotations, as he always does, through the scholarship of Buddhism, how this explanation was prepared with groundwork. And I'll go back to an old analogy. That understanding the ratio between a circumference and a radius of a circle and labeling it pi as this irrational number, 3.14159, so on and so forth, to a two-year-old is utterly useless. To a 10-year-old, it barely has any... The context isn't there yet. They're just starting to understand abstract shapes and things and the ratios and so on. It's just... So certain steps have to happen first. What is a circle? <laughs> and how do we measure it? Oh, yeah. So what Nietzsche is going to break down for us is through the rhetoric of Buddhahood or enlightenment, that enlightenment, Buddhahood, stages of learning, all of those terminologies we take for granted today had early stages. In other words, adding and subtraction for a five-year-old are basically how many pieces of orange do you have and how many do you not and even more rudimentary than that here's an orange yay here's me taking it away sad you're just beginning to learn addition and subtraction and we can call it math at every stage but just because it's called math doesn't mean you understand quantum and so he's applying this logic to the teachings of Shakyamuni. What an enlightening thing. And a lot of us in this time take for granted this path and pattern of the teachings. And not understanding that results in people finding some old ancient teaching, commentary, sutra, and mistaking that for the end-all, be-all of the teachings, not understanding the proper perspective to have on that particular teaching. And obviously, Nietzsche was dealing with the same thing. And obviously, the other schools that were misleading people in their practice used this lack of understanding in their very purposefully use of manipulating for personal gain, whether that is prestige or inculcating themselves into a particular group or elites or government subsidies, so on and so forth, right? So, Nitrin takes the time to dissect this, and it could be a bit of a wild ride, so let's see what how he does this. Having listened to Lord Shakyamuni preach the Lotus Sutra, various great bodhisattvas, the king of the Brahma heaven, Indra, sun god, moon god, you know, all of the people listed in the Lotus Sutra, types of mind, yeah, truly became his disciples. So this is important because, again, remember, these are personages. They're not actual people. So what he's saying is that with this teaching, all of these various mental types, tendencies and conditions, these various levels of understanding, all benefit from, can hear, can actualize, can benefit from what is now being said. Every sutra is written this way, right?
his disciples, since the Buddha considered them his own disciples, he sternly advised and commanded them as stated in the Beholding the Stupa of Treasures chapter of the Lotus Sutra, quote, The Buddha told the great crowd, Anyone who would strive to uphold, read, and recite the sutra after my death, Shakyamuni, should make sworn statements in front of me. In other words, you have to take a solemn vow. You can't just say, I'm part of that club. You have to really commit to being part of this effort. And so those great bodhisattvas and others followed the Buddha just as a gale blows twigs of a small tree, as good fortune grass is swayed by a gale or rivers flow into oceans. They really made the commitment right? It wasn't just a fashionable thing to do this week. However, since it had not been long since the preaching of the Lotus Sutra had begun, it seemed to them dreamlike and unreal. See that, that magical thinking is still in there. So they're trying to find a way to take this teaching, very specific teaching about how the mind works and how to self-attain, self-realize Buddha and there's still you know, little twinkles around their periphery. And where's the magic in this? And what, what kind of um, rituals and magical formulas or personages? You know, how can I externalize this? Because it can't be me. He can't possibly mean I can do this. This is what Shakyamuni was struggling with. And by the time he's teaching the Lotus Sutra, he's hoping he's prepared these minds that are following him around, committing themselves to study, that they really get it, that they don't stray in their heads and go, it's the Bodhi tree that did it. <laughs> no. Right? Because that's, that's humans. That's what we do. Why should, it, why should I be responsible for all of this power? It can't just be me. Hmm. How frustrating. Then there appeared a stupa of treasures. Now again, this is in the mind, right? Our gohanzan in the mind. Not the mandala behind me. That's a focal point we're using to trick our earthly senses into looking inward at the real source of Buddhahood, our mind. Then there appeared a stupa of treasures which not only verified the first half of the preaching of the Lotus Sutra to be true, but also prepared the way for the preaching of the latter half. Still, he's preparing. Here's the last step. Pay attention. Commit to this. I'm about to take that mystic cloud away. Are you ready? So this is the first half of the Lotus Sutra, right? Referring to all the Buddhas who appeared from all the worlds in the universe, the Buddha declared that they were all his own manifestations. So that's the first step. All of these different, quote, Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, all of these personages that I've been talking about for years and years, 40 years now, they're not people. They're not real entities. They are mental conditions that I have conjured as an expedient means for you to understand the various states of awareness that you have. That you have the capacity to realize, can experience. So that's the first step. That's a biggie. 
Shakyamuni Buddha and the Buddha of many treasures took seats side by side in the stupa that hung in the sky. This is the story of the lotus now. Appearing like the sun and the moon rising together in the blue sky, a large crowd of men and gods appeared in the sky like constellations while Fujin, Buddhas, all of these Buddhas, all of us, all of those, listen, those mental capacities, all assemble, took lion-shaped thrones under the jeweled trees. Compared to this, when the Lotus Repository world appeared in the Flower Garland Sutra, now here we go with the relative comparisons. Buddhas with reward body in this world and other worlds in the universe stayed in their respective worlds. Buddhas of other worlds did not come to this world to proclaim themselves to be manifestations of Shakyamuni. They were still identified as other. Nor did Shakyamuni visit them in other worlds in the universe. Only such great bodhisattvas as Dharma wisdom came from other worlds in the universe to see Shakyamuni Buddha in this world. Right? This is a, the early teaching where he's still individuating. Right? The eight venerable ones on eight lotus petals surrounding the great sun Buddha who appeared upon preaching of the great sun Buddha Sutra and the 37 venerable ones who appeared upon the preaching of the Diamond Peak Sutra seem to be avatars of the great sun Buddha. However, unlike those Buddhas who appeared upon preaching of the Lotus Sutra, they were not Buddhas from the past completely provided with threefold bodies. The thousand Buddhas of the Wisdom Sutra and various Buddhas who appeared in the six directions upon the preaching of the Pure Land Sutra, unlike those Funjin Buddhas who came to this world to listen to the Lotus Sutra, did not bother to make long trips to visit this world from their prospective lands. Those Buddhas who gathered together from the worlds in the universe where the Sutra of the Great Assembly was preached were also not Funjin Buddhas. In other words, those were all types and not even of the three bodies, as he was indicating earlier, of specific body. In other words, these were steps along the way of understanding the manifestations of the mind and how the mind could experience the world, the universe by extension, the entirety, always the entirety of the universe, because what Buddhism is about is life, all of it, in every single moment. Ah, we're getting there. But you see how we're slowly arriving? Those Buddhas who gathered together from the worlds in the universe when the Sutra of Great Assembly was preached were also not Fujin Buddhas. The four Buddhas appearing in four directions when the Sutra of Golden Splendor was preached were merely Buddhas in transformed bodies, avatars, personages, not in manifestation. In no sutra except for the Lotus Sutra are those Buddhas who had obtained Buddhahood after years of practice and who completely possessed the threefold bodies referred to by Shakyamuni Buddha as my manifestations. In other words, my enlightenment the three-bodied Buddhas are me. And I am the three-bodies Buddha as enlightened. And this is what we all do. That's big. Big mic drop moment, yeah? But still, it's like, it's taking shape. It's a, from all of those to one, just you, right? Just you, Shakyamuni. This is what you did. Yeah, right? Still not quite getting it. Now in the 11th chapter of the Lotus Sutra, beholding the stupa of treasures, a step was taken in preparation for revealing the eternal Buddha in the 16th chapter. You see how he's leading up to it? 
the duration of the life of the Tathagata. It is stated in the Beholding of the Stupa of Treasures chapter that Shakyamuni Buddha, who had attained enlightenment for the first time only 40 years or so ago, before the Bodhi tree, uh, under the Bodhi tree at Buddha Gaya in India, called the crowd of Buddhas who had obtained Buddhahood as far earlier as one Kalpa or ten My manifestations. He was already rubbing up against that, that idea of these others just being his realization, his mind. A realization of this enlightenment being not solely of his making, but something pre-existing Shakyamuni, him. He was hinting at it. He was rubbing up against that. This was against the principle of equality among Buddhas and greatly surprised everyone. Wait a minute. You're not just one of a great line of Buddhas? There aren't all these universal Buddhas? Wait a minute. I'm, I'm lost. I mean, so, on the one hand, you're the only one we know that is Buddha. And all these Buddhas you've talked about, they're not your buddies. They're your imagination. What? If Shakyamuni Buddha had attained enlightenment only 40 years or so before, large crowds of people all over the universe would not be waiting for his guidance. Yeah, that makes sense. Why would Buddhas from all over the universe and foreign lands see this magical thinking all over the, the universe and cosmos be waiting to hear from you? They're Buddhas. Why? Yeah, I guess that's a good question. Mm, right? Even if he was capable of appearing in manifestation to guide them in various worlds, it would have been of no use. Grandmaster Tendai said in his profound meaning of the Lotus Sutra, Fasal 9, since there are so many of his manifestations, we should know that he has been Buddha for a long time. See, it's not just Nietzsche saying this, right? Centuries before him, Tendai pointed this out. It represents the consternation of the great assembly, men and gods, who were surprised at the great number of Buddhas and manifestation. So they're still not quite getting it. They're still thinking, Shakyamuni, this guy, made himself all over the universe and all these other worlds? No, 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 no. They want to be mystical, magical. He's saying, this is the experience of mind. My understanding is universal. Not that those things are separate from me. Still not quite getting it. This was against the principle of equality amongst Buddhas and greatly surprised everyone. If Sakamuni had attained, blah, 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 he was capable of manifesting various worlds, it would have been of no use. Blah, blah, blah. Sorry, sorry, sorry. To add to their surprise, the numerous great bodhisattvas who had been guided by the original Buddha in the past sprang out of the earth all over the whole world, according to the 15th chapter of the Lotus Sutra. That's talking about the future now, you and I. Appearance of bodhisattvas from underground, right? We're growing and we will manifest in the future like, a, like the lotus flower. They looked incomparably superior to bodhisattvas Fugen, universal sage, and Manju, Manjushri, who had been regarded as ranking disciples of Shakyamuni Buddha. Compared to these bodhisattvas coming from underground, those great bodhisattvas who had gathered upon the preaching of the Flower Garland Sutra, the Hodo Sutras, and Wisdom Sutra, and the Beholding of the Stupa Sutra, uh, Treasures chapter of the Lotus Sutra, or the 16 bodhisattvas such as Bodhisattva Vajrasattva, in the Great Sun Buddha Sutra and other sutras, 
They looked like monkeys waiting on Indra or woodcutters associating with court nobles, even Bodhisattva Maitreya, successor to Shakyamuni Buddha, did not know who they were. And neither did the gods and men below him, because they're future manifestations, yeah? Sorry, ah, my I say. Among those great bodhisattvas appearing from out of the earth, of the whole world, the four great sages, Jogyo, superior practices, Muhengyo, limitless practice, Jogyo, pure practice, and Anryugyo, steadily established practice. You see these personages? They're aspects of you and I, yes? How do we practice these various ways? Awe-stricken by these four, those great bodhisattvas and others who had come to listen to the preaching of the Lotus Sutra and up in the sky could not even gaze upon them nor understand who they were. We haven't heard of these people before. Standing in front of these four who had come from underground, Four Bodhisattvas in the Flower Garland Sutra, four Bodhisattvas in the Great Sun Buddha Sutra, and 16 Bodhisattvas in the Diamond Peak Sutra seemed to be men squinting at the sun or fishermen facing the emperor. So these are previous teachings, right? So these Bodhisattvas spoken of in earlier teachings are shielding themselves from the brilliance of these future Bodhisattvas. In other words, there's a hierarchy there, right? These four bodhisattvas from underground were like the four sages, such as Tang Kung Wang, living with the people, or four elder statements of Shang Shan, waiting on Emperor Hui, the second emperor of the former Han Dynasty. Indeed, the four bodhisattvas from underground appeared commanding and awe-inspiring. With the exception of Shakyamuni, the Buddha of many treasures and Buddhas in manifestations, they would have been looked up to by everyone as good friends. Wondering who they were, Bodhisattva Maitreya said to himself, because this is a self-questioning now, right? I know all Bodhisattvas in this world as well as those great Bodhisattvas coming from all over the universe since the time Shakyamuni was still crown prince through 42 years of preaching after his enlightenment at the age of 30 until his preaching of the Lotus Sutra in Mount Sacred Eagle, right? Today, I know also every great Bodhisattva is all pure and even, because he knows, every student of his knows all of the teachings that have led up to this. That's what this is saying, right? I know all of these. from all over the universe where I was sent on errands or visited on my own, but I've never seen Bodhisattva like these because something new is happening here. A greater depth of understanding is happening here. Haven't been confronted with this before. You're saying all of these Buddhas were manifestations of your mind, part of your enlightenment, but they're not quite getting that yet. And so what he's now presenting is something very new and not just new in we think of new as an evolution of, but new as a trash everything you've ever thought new. A huge paradigm shift is happening now. When we see the rain pouring, we can tell the size of the dragon who caused it. When we see large lotus flowers blooming, we can tell the depth of the lotus pond. I wonder what land they come from and what the Buddha, uh, what Buddha they were lucky enough to meet and what kinds of great dharmas they learned and practiced. So something, something amazing is about to come to light here. No pun intended. Shakyamuni, or uh, Nichiren says, Bodhisattva Maitreya was speechless. 
But perhaps with the Buddha's assistance, he was able to put his question to Sakyamuni. So this is what he said. We have never seen these immeasurable numbers of bodhisattvas. Of course not. They're not here yet. But who expounded the Dharma for these bodhisattvas of great virtue, power, and energy? Who taught and guided them? Under whom did they begin to aspire for enlightenment and what teaching of the Buddha did they praise? Buddha, the world-honored one, I have never seen them before. Please let us know the name of the world they come from. I know none of them. They appeared suddenly from under the ground. Please let us know why they emerged. Grandmaster Tendai explains this in his words and phrases of the Lotus Sutra as follows. Now this is Tendai. From the Buddha's first preaching under the Bodhi tree, after obtaining enlightenment, until the preaching of the Lotus Sutra today, there has always been an inflow of great bodhisattvas coming from various worlds in the, in the universe to listen to him preach. Their number is limited, but I, Maitreya, saw saw them and remembered them with all my wisdom as the successor of the Buddha. I've been here all along, watching all of this. You understand, bodhisattvas from all over the world, they're just collective experience attitudes of the minds that are starting to be students of Shakyamuni. And they bring to the, to the discourse their experience of the worlds from all over the universe, be it India or Jampudvipa, same thing. I also made trips to various worlds in the universe to see Buddhas in person and became acquainted with the beings there. Nevertheless, there is not even one whom I know amongst these bodhisattvas. Something very new is being presented here, right? Grandmaster Miao Lo further explained in his annotations on the words and phrases of the Lotus Sutra, quote, wise men know things in advance as a snake knows that it is a snake. The meaning of these words in the Lotus Sutra and annotations by Tendai and Miao Lo are clear. That is to say, nobody had ever seen or heard of those bodhisattvas from the earth after Shakyamuni's enlightenment under the Bodhi tree until that day, either in this world or in any of the worlds in the universe. So this is something Shakyamuni hasn't discussed. He, he's discussed of, he's discussed various mental types from all over the world, from all over the universe, whether he labels them bodhisattvas as he would label those who are very close to understanding his teachings to Shravakas or Pratyabhudas or, or laymen, laywomen from all over the universe. He's including all human experience vis-a-vis -vis those who are listening to him. Yeah. But he's never talked about future bodhisattvas. It's always been a historical context. And that's how people have experienced the world for thousands of years, yeah? So to think about future peoples is extending, surely they they know their future is a, a real thing, but they've never really dug into the accomplishments that might result of, or mental types that might result. It's not, uh, it's not been part of the discourse for 40, 42 years, yeah? That's not been the focus. So this is this is new. We're breaking a new ground here. What does this mean? This is what Manjushri is asking, right? What what something absolutely new is about to happen here? This is to say nobody had ever heard of those uh, bodhisattvas from under the earth after Shakyamuni's enlightenment. So the Buddha answered the question of Bodhisattva Maitreya. You want to know what Buddha taught them or is going to teach him, whatever. Time gets tossed around in this stuff, yeah? Maitreya, it was I who taught and guided those great bodhisattvas 
whom you said you had never seen. After I attained perfect enlightenment in this Saha world, I taught, guided, and controlled them and encouraged them to aspire for enlightenment. There's the whole ball of wax right there in case, I mean, they, they may be missing it, but you're not, right? He continued, After I sat in meditation under the Bodhi tree near the town of Gaia and was able to attain perfect enlightenment, I taught and guided them while preaching the supreme dharma and caused them to aspire for enlightenment. Now they've all been proceeding to the highest enlightenment without falling back, so on and so forth. I have taught and guided them since the eternal past. Oh man, he's starting to transcend his identity as Shakyamuni. They may not be catching this yet in the Lotus Sutra, but he's dropping bombs as he goes. What he's suggesting here is that no other than Buddha has been their teacher. And since Buddha is abides with life since time without beginning or end, then in truth, the cause of their enlightenment has been taught, has been extant in themselves since time without beginning. So the language here seems to dance around, still seems kind of magical and mystical, but he's actually being quite clear in what he's trying to get everyone to understand. Is that Shakyamuni, the guy you're talking to that's talking to you right now, is just this provisional moment in time expressing truth that is timeless, that I've, I, as Buddha, have instructed, has borne out, has been all along, not me, Shakyamuni, me, Buddha, talking as Buddha, the mouthpiece for Buddhaness. See, this is where the confusion always occurs, right? Then Bodhisattva Maitreya and the other great Bodhisattvas began to doubt the Buddha. Oh man, this is starting to sound shit. What, what have I been doing with my life for all these years following this crazy man? Oh my goodness. What are you saying? They're still stuck on this, right? They're not, they're not quite getting what he's saying. And to their credit, I, it's, it's a little bit poorly communicated, but I'm not 3,000 years old. I don't know what people were used to how discourse happened. So we can't be too critical, especially understanding that this is how many translations from the actual, right? But the meaning of it, the understanding of what is being described and what is difficult to understand comes through. So if we don't get too hung up on the words, it's pretty clear, actually. Yeah? At the time, the Flower Garland Sutra was preached. Numerous great bodhisattvas, such as Dharma Wisdom, gathered. While wondering who they were, Maitreya and the others were told by Shakyamuni Buddha, apparently to their satisfaction. The Dharma... Uh, wisdom and the other great bodhisattvas were Shakyamuni's good friends. Okay, cool. Right? Very simple justification for what he was teaching when he first in reached enlightenment. The same thing happened to those great bodhisattvas who gathered together at the Daihobo where the Sutra of the Great Assembly was preached and to those who gathered at the Lake White Heron upon the preaching of the Wisdom Sutra. Every time Shakyamuni expanded his teachings to include different kinds of mental types, different kinds of perfection, so on and so forth. When they asked, where did that come from? Where did these, when did you teach these? Oh, they're all my good friends. Okay. Okay, man, you got a lot of friends. Yeah. The great bodhisattvas appearing from underground now, however, 
seemed incomparably superior to them, and it appeared probably that they were teachers of Shakyamuni Buddha. Wait a minute. Nevertheless, the Buddha declared that it was he who caused them to aspire for enlightenment, as if the Buddha taught and guided immature people as his disciples. It was only natural, therefore, that Bodhisattva Mahatra and the others had serious doubts about Shakyamuni Buddha. Okay, you're here now, and everything we've heard about your teachings of all these other people are people that we've equated ourselves with. Now you bring forth these bodhisattvas. They're, they're foreigners. They're nothing like us. They're something different. Uh, did you learn Buddhism from them? Oh, you taught them too? Well, where have they been all this time? They're from the future? How do you? How the hell do you pull that hat trick? They're confused. Prince Shotoku of Japan was the son of Emperor Yome and uh, the thir 20, 32nd sovereign of Japan. When he was six years old, elderly men come, came, uh, coming from Pakche, Koguryo, and Tang, China, paid homage to the emperor. The six-year-old crown prince declared that they were his disciples, and these elderly men, holding hands in reverence, said that the crown prince was their teacher. It was indeed a wonder. It is also said in a non-Buddhist work that a certain man, while walking on a street, came across a young man about 30 years older, or 30 years old, beating an old man about 80 years old on the street. Asked what was the matter, the story says, the young man answered that this elderly man was beating, uh, was beating, ah, that this elderly man he was beating was his son. The relationship between Shakyamuni and great bodhisattvas from underground is similar to these stories. So there's an so this explains my earlier question. There's a cultural understanding of remember how strong filial piety is, this connection of ancestry to the present. See, it runs through all of this Asiatic conversation. So this story about the 30-year-old disciplining an 80-year-old man with the ex apparent excuse that the 80-year-old man is actually his son, though that doesn't make logical sense, has this traditional cultural sense of embodied... Um, it's more than tradition. It's a... It's a filial identity. It's a discipline of comportment. It's the best way I can describe it. And so Shakyamuni is teaching with this cultural device to get his point across. That although these are bodhisattvas from the future, their enlightenment comes from the same place as mine. And my enlightenment, if I speak from that enlightenment, is the teacher that taught me, Shakyamuni, and taught them, therefore I taught them. Do you see the filial? It, it can be confusing, but if you know this about the way cultural identity is formed in these cultures, then the teaching starts to make more sense. It's less literal. Yeah? Therefore, Bodhisattva Maitre and the others asked a question. World honored one. When you were the crown prince, Siddhartha, you left the palace of the Shakya clan and sat in meditation under the Bodhi tree not far from the town of Gaya until you attained perfect enlightenment. Sort of briefly covered his 12 years of pilgrimage there. It has only been 40 years or so. How could you, Shakyamuni, world-honored one, Buddha, achieve so much in a short time, in this short of a time? 
You see how they're wrestling with identity here? For 40 years or so, starting, and that's the end of the quote, for 40 years or so, ending with the, uh, starting with the Flower Garland Sutra, Bodhisattvas have asked questions in every assembly to dispel the doubts all beings might have had. Right? This is the way the sutras work. You ask a question three times, I answer it, you progress in your understanding and your learning, right? This, however, is the most serious question of all. In the Sutra of Infinite Meaning, for instance, 80,000 bodhisattvas such as Great Adornment put forth a serious question concerning the apparent discrepancy in time required for attaining Buddhahood. Because you attain it immediately, but they're not, they haven't gotten that yet. They still think it takes all these lifetimes and so forth to attain Buddhahood, right? While it has been said in the sutras preached in the first 40 years or so that it would take many kalpas, now it was preached that one could obtain Buddhahood quickly through the teaching of the Sutra of Infinite Meaning. However serious that que the question of Great Adornment Bodhisattva was, that of Maitreya was more crucial. She picks this time to do this nasal sucking. I'm sorry, once again. Namo myoho denge kyo. In another instance cited in the Sutra of Meditation on the Buddha of Infinite Life, it is said that King Ajatasatru, uh, in, incited by Devadatta, imprisoned his own father, King Bimbisara, and tried to murder his own mother, Vaideha. Vaidehi. But two loyal subjects, Jivaka and Kandrabhara, talked him into releasing his mother, inviting the Buddha. Vaidehi, first of all, asked this question, quote, For what crime I might have committed in past lives did I give birth to such an evil son like this? What causes you, world-honored one, to be born as a cousin of such a wicked man as Devadatta? Of these two questions, what causes you, world-honored one, so on and so forth, is a very serious doubt. Quote, wheel-turning noble kings are not born together with enemies. Indra does not live together with a demon. The Buddha has been a man of compassion from the time of innumerable kalpas in the past. Right? Time without beginning. Why was he born related to Devadatta, the great enemy? Isn't it because he was not really the Buddha? Vaidehi might have well wondered. The Buddha did not answer this question. Therefore, those who read the Sutra of Meditation on the Buddha of Infinite Life do not understand the real relationship between Shakyamuni and Devadatta unless they read the 12th chapter of the Lotus Sutra, Devadatta. This serious question from Vedehi was not as serious a question as the one asked by Maitreya. Still not as serious. The 36 questions asked by Kashapa in the Nirvana Sutra were also not as serious as the one asked by Maitreya in the Lotus Sutra. If the Buddha had not squarely answered the question to dispel this doubt, all the profound teachings of the Buddha's lifetime would have appeared as worthless as bubbles, and the question of everyone would have remained unanswered. Here lies the importance of the 16th chapter of the Lotus Sutra, the duration of the life of the Tathagata. The Tathagata being Buddha Ness, not just Shakyamuni. Where are we time-wise? Ah, I'm going on and on. Well, this may be a good place to pause because now we're going. he's going to really nail this 16th chapter thing, which is... For Nichiren, if you were, if I were to list, you know, what are the key components of Nichiren's doctrine? Certainly the 3,000 realms in a single thought moment would loom large, perhaps number one. But joined equally, 
by his understanding of the 16th chapter of the Lotus Sutra. Because it is in that chapter where the realization of the actual fact of 3,000 realms in a single thought moment materialize. It's been talked about. It's been introduced. But in the 16th chapter, when Shakyamuni says, look, stop looking at me, the human, and understand that I'm speaking to you as Buddhaness. I'm just like this facilitator portal. I'm being the ultimate bodhisattva. I'm showing you, telling you how to realize this thing we call Buddha. Ultimately, me, Shakya Muni, Siddhartha Gautama, man, I'm just, I'm just a, a megaphone for Buddha, which is a mirror of all of you. It's something, I am being the mirror of all of you. It's, it's not unique to me. You do this. Namu Myoho You do this. It's a critical moment. It's a moment that understands Buddhahood, the perception of 3,000 realms, which is far more than 3,000, right? The, the maximal potential of all energies in the universe manifesting in each moment, Buddhahood. It's the translation between the mind and this physical existence. It's that very description of enlightenment. To me, these are the two most important points of Nietzsche's doctrine. And he spends his whole life trying to bring this to the fore. Just as Shakyamuni did. And Tendai and Dengyo and Miaolo, and for their parts, Nargarjuna, Vasubandhu, so on and so forth. But not until this modern age of incredible distraction do we paradoxically have the ability to see, experience this truth. Albeit amongst a tremendous plethora of distraction the age of degeneration thank you for listening thank you for being here thank you for your support don't forget to like and subscribe please subscribe we're almost at a thousand uh subscribers which is a, a landmark it's very exciting it, it changes the way this sangha this channel moves throughout the youtube computer gods, <laughs> right? The algorithms. Um, that's amazing. So I have, I profoundly thank you for participating and share, share these videos, any particular videos that might help you and your friends practice together. Don't forget all the free information on threefoldlows.com. If you can, you can support on Patreon. You can support through PayPal, paypal.me slash Sylvain, or buy a, a purchase a, a book, a writing that might help you study on the bookstore. If you don't have a mandala yet, I don't know what your excuse is. You must get a properly ins Nietzschean inscribed mandala. Keep your practice strong. Keep your health strong. Take care of yourself. Be kind to yourself. And I'll see you in the next one. Thank you so much for being here. I look forward to the next. Oh yeah. Bye for now. <laughs>